Welcome everyone. This is our second session of the Direct Care Resilience Series. We're really excited to have you today and uh, let's go ahead and get started with today's session. Um, if you could please put your name and um, where you're joining us from in the chat, that'd be great because we love to see where everybody's joining us from. So the purpose of this project is to be able to expand agencies' leadership's capacity to support employee mental health. Uh, we also want to build direct care professionals' resilient skills by increasing awareness of mental health, self-care, and provide resources to help sustain and strengthen the current workforce to ideally uh, limit staff turnover. This project was funded through the Administration for Community Living, and we partnered with the Institute on Community Integration at the University of Minnesota. This is the third implementation of the series, and it includes new speakers, additional strategies on various topics, and new sessions. So um, if you've joined us before, you kind of know that this series has three focus areas with sessions towards, or that are tailored towards creating an organizational culture that supports employee mental health. Um, we provide, some of the sessions provide supervisor strategies to mitigate and prevent employee uh, burnout and also providing evidence-based coping strategies for stress management and building personal resilience. So before we begin, we really wanna describe what an ECHO session is and what sets them apart from your typical uh, webinar trainings. In essence, ECHO allows us to move information and not people. It allows you, the participant, to actively learn about a topic and become a resource for your community. Each session, there's gonna be a formal didactic portion on a designated topic, followed by a case presentation. Uh, the case presentation is an opportunity for participants to present a case of a real life scenario and get feedback and resources from our content specialist, as well as other participants. This is really an excellent opportunity to learn about resources and new ways to assist your employees and in turn, uh, the people that you support every single day. So we encourage you to take part in the case presentation discussions. Um, you can put your information or you can put your questions and suggestions in the Zoom chat or um, feel free to unmute. And also, if you want to present a case in the upcoming sessions, uh, reach out and we'll provide more information on how to make that happen. Your participation is really key to the success of our ECHO sessions. We really wanna create an interactive community where presenters, stakeholders, and community members all support each other during a session. So we encourage you to turn on your camera during the case presentation, um, as long as you're comfortable doing so. And we appreciate when participants um, ask questions after the didactic and provide feedback for the case. These case narratives are the best way to solidify any skills that are learned in the didactics and receive direct advice. So feel free to upload your questions into the Zoom chat and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. So we do provide uh, professional development, social work and nursing um, credits. To receive credit, we ask that you fill out the evaluation um, at the end of this session, and you can also access um, the content that's provided in the session through the iEcho platform at any point. Which leads us to some of our housekeeping um, notes. So to set up your iEcho account, we'll send you a registration link, um, and it'll come from noreply at iEcho.org. Please check your junk mail if you didn't receive this email prior to the session. Some participants have had experience uh, issues with organizational firewalls. So uh, please reach out directly to us and we'll help you troubleshoot any issues. And just want to note that iEcho is an essential tool for anyone participating in ECHO programs. It allows you to access uh, the content that's covered in the series in one place. And it also helps you find other ECHO networks throughout the globe. So any topic that you're wanting more training on, you can search in iEcho for that. And um, typically they offer social work credits as well. So if you're interested in that, that's a great resource to find free professional development. All right, finally, we're gonna go on to introductions. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers, uh, Michelle uh, Williams and Beth Livingston. So we'll go ahead and pass it on over to you gals. Hello, thank you, Krista. We're very yes, excited we're to be here. We're here together and also virtually, as you can see. Um, <laughs> but it's more fun to be interactive when we're in the same room. So we're looking forward to this presentation. Yes. Um, so Michelle and I are both uh, associate professors at the Tippy College of Business at the University of Iowa in the management entrepreneurship departments. And Michelle and I have worked in the same institution for a number of years now yes. and have moved. Um, both of us have have relocated um, also from similar yes. <laughs> place 
And so we've worked together for a lot and it's really uh, an honor and, and will be exciting for us to present for you here today. Um, so as Krista noted, kind of the general layout of what we're going to talk about in terms of, you know, we'll, we're going to have a component where we kind of go through some slides and we, we talk about um, the topic that we're here to talk about, about connection and inclusion and building trusted relationships. And then, and, and in the, the the process of that, Michelle is going to talk a little, she's going to bring up a case and then we're going to return to that at the end and we'll open it back up to all of you all to share. Sound good? Okay. So with that, let's do, uh, let me um, share my screen. And make sure... Awesome. We've seen the correct screen mm -hmm. all as well. Perfect. Great. And so again, um, we're going to talk about creating cultures of inclusion and belonging and uh, cultivating trusting relationships with that. And we're going to start with one of the core problems around well-being. May is um, a month for mental health awareness and well-being. And loneliness is one of the key problems that's come up um, in research that's increasing over time. So this graph shows that loneliness is a problem and it's increasing over time. Um, some people you know, in the media have said, oh, it's a pandemic. Um, so it's not increasing at that rate, but the importance of the increase um, really came to a head during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, so you can see here from a set of studies that loneliness increased during the pandemic. There were so many reasons for that. People being isolated at home, not being able to go into work. Um, and that change in work structure, interestingly, has not changed that much. People found that there are some benefits to being at home as well as um, the downside of loneliness. So really we're seeing a proliferation of hybrid work now. So people um, are often working at home and sometimes in hybrid situations. And one of the most difficult things for uh, managers and caseworkers is to be able to uh, maintain that culture and that connection when you're not seeing people in person and you're not seeing them as often. Importantly, you know, loneliness is not just something that we we're hearing about in the media that we've been talking about, you know, in, in terms of, of, you know, articles concerned about people's connections. We know that it has very real effects. And when you look at the research in terms of what the costs of loneliness are, you can see um, that the lonely, that, that reports of loneliness are significantly related to depressive symptoms. Um, so you see there a correlation of 0.50, that's about 25% uh, of shared variance between those two things. Um, and that relationship, meaning the, the connection between people feeling lonely and also reporting depressive symptoms have been growing stronger, stronger over time. And that is pre-pandemic, right? And so we see this is a that the, the connection between these perceptions of loneliness and depressive symptoms are strong. We also know that uh, people who report loneliness uh, also have a higher risk factor for all causes mortality, about 1.22 times. Again, this was pre-pandemic. And so as Michelle noted, there have been some increases in these issues um, that were spurred on by the pandemic that sort of popped us up a little bit until we came back to our sort of normal trajectory or rate of change, um, which suggests that these risk factors may indeed be increasing as well. We also know just in general that people who report higher loneliness also tend to report more serious consequences um, related to their physical and their mental well-being. Um, we see related to physical health, um, to mental health sorts of, of outcomes. And uh, again, this is sort of represented in meta-analytic evidence, which is a sort of summary of everything we've known over time. Um, all of which is to say, uh, loneliness is a severe issue that has gotten more important and gotten more salient for people, particularly since the pandemic. Um, but it has always been related to very severe, serious physical and mental well-being outcomes. And you can see this both in terms of your coworkers 
the subordinates you support and also clients yeah, yeah, yeah. have experiencing loneliness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anytime you are in a, a client-based or a customer-based field, you're not only dealing with stakeholders related to your boss, your manager, your coworkers, um, but you're also dealing with other, you know, with people outside of your organization that are part of it in a stakeholder manner, which are customers, clients, um, patients, et cetera. Um, related to nice segue, Michelle, thank you. Um, that these issues of loneliness, we, we spend a lot of our time at work, right? We spend a third of our time doing or at work. Uh, and what we find is that loneliness can be exacerbated by people's work experiences. And we know that connections at work are important. Um, recent a survey research has suggested that one in 10 people report having zero friends at work, right? If you ask them 10% of them, like I don't, I have no one. Uh, and that is critically important um, because 70% of employees say that friends at work are crucial for their happiness, not just their job satisfaction, but their overall happiness and their, their mental well being. Um, we also know beyond just feeling better about yourself, uh, strong work relationships, these, these connections at work result in more engaged employees that produce higher quality work. So it's not just, oh, you feel better. It's not, you know, I know there's a lot of, well, it's touchy feel. It's just the right thing to do, but it's also good business practice. When people feel disengaged from their coworkers, they also tend to feel disengaged from their work. Um, and this is supported by uh, research from Gallup that demonstrates that 20% of people um, who report having work besties. So people that not just, you know, friends at work, but real close connections that, that, um, um, are facilitating, you know, deep connections, deep relationships, sort of this antithesis of loneliness at work um, are less likely to leave. And so I think one of the biggest issues I think both Michelle and I have been hearing from organizations, particularly over the past year, but but really longer than that, decades now, are these concerns with turnover and the cost of turnover and how are we going to fill all these positions? We're seeing that in healthcare. Yeah. We are seeing that in, in social work and community-based care. How are we going to get people? And one of the things I think that is critically important uh, as sort of the first stage of that is hold on to the people that you have already. Exactly. <laughs> and in parallel to Gallup, this finding by Gallup, Gallup has found that there is almost a pandemic of um, lack of work engagement. Yes. And yes. this, you know, surprisingly, not only applies to um, frontline workers, but they're finding that managers are now becoming more and more disengaged. And so that creates, you know, those, the loneliness that could be um, really fast, really, um, compensated for by having peer relationships as well as supporting your subordinates. Absolutely. And I mean, I think this quote sort of sums up just how important these issues it are. It really right? does. The people who had the warmest connections with other people weren't just happier. They stayed healthier longer and they lived longer, which is something we all <laughs> want. Um, we get little hits of well-being, if you will, from all kinds of relationships, from friends, family, and work colleagues. And the piece that this uh, quote doesn't mention, just hints at, is that we get small hits of well-being. So these interactions can be, um, can be those momentary interactions with people, with service people. When you get, when you go to the supermarket, when you go to, um, get your coffee. So when we think about not only our support, but we think about clients, those types of interactions, when we can facilitate those types of interactions, we can facilitate their well-being. Yeah, I think it's important. I, I think all of us know how important those negative little moments can be, right? We come home, those are the things we complain about to our to our family, to our spouse, to our partners, right? Like those small things you're, that just drove you nuts during the day. But we often don't think about how the small positive connections can have the opposite effect on us. Um, oftentimes I think we think like, like the last slide I showed you, I need to have a work bestie. I need to have someone like, oh, I'm so close with. Um, but that's not what the research shows. Yeah, and just seeing yeah. that same person at the water cooler every day. Um, Jane Dedden and I, did a series of interviews with staff people and we asked them to talk about a positive experience at work. And we thought they would have these, you know, big kind of things when they got an award or when they did that. And they had really small things. Like they went in to fix someone's computer and they offered them a candy bar, right? They asked about their mother who'd been, <laughs> you know, placed in, in a nursing home. Those are the things that people remember and make them feel apart. Absolutely. So while, while we know that this is important, it is also hard. <laughs> it is. 
of employees believe that their company should be doing more to promote workplace connections. Um, and especially when we think about the pandemic and then the downturn in the economy for a lot of different fields, uh, uh, tech, for instance, had overhired, that fo companies aren't focusing or weren't focusing on those workplace, the workplace culture, and how do we have a culture where people feel connected? Um, the second point is employees who devoted time um, to fostering work friendships and report, report greater personal and professional growth. And so this, again, is a piece that says these relationships aren't just about being being personally happy and personal well-being, which is important, but they're also about learning and growth at work. And for things, for industries like healthcare and like social work, a lot of growth is in connection. You're growing by interacting with people who have been in the field longer. You're growing kind of through almost reverse mentoring by people who are entering the field with new uh, with new strategies that you may not have got have gotten when you were at school. And so those connections, particularly across generations, yeah. are really important. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the things we hear companies say all the time is people, 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 people matter. We're a family, right? Like you, I think all of us can hear those sort of, those, the, the, those statements and those sentiments. But I think this research demonstrates that even if companies are saying that, there are a lot of companies falling short of building that sort of culture exactly. where people truly feel that they've connected and truly feel that it is safe and supportive for them for them to do that. And so this is going to lead us to the first time we're going to ask you all to feedback. I don't know if you all have used Mentimeter before. I hope that you have. If you haven't, well, welcome to Mentimeter. Um, Mentimeter is very easy. You do not have to sign up for anything. You can just go to menti.com. You see at the top there, M-E-N-T-I.com. You just click in that eight digit code and then you should be able to vote. And so you can do that on your device. If you have a phone, right, you can plug it in there. Um, and you can just keep that uh, window open and we'll ask a couple of questions throughout the day. And so the first question that we have- Can you hold on one second? Yeah. When you go to menti.com, I'm just going to read you the code for um, anyone who might perfect. be visually yes, impaired. Thank you. Yes. The code number is 32944924. It's great. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, there, our first question here is, so- which, oh, you keep oh, going. Wait. I'm just going to put the yeah, code yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What do we think of these things is most important? Yeah. Three, nine, four. Yeah. Three, two, nine, so the code is now in the chat for anyone. Yeah. So if you were thinking of building a good relation, a work relationship, we talked about how difficult these things yeah. are. What do you think is most important? And I see these numbers rolling in and you, you've definitely, people are identifying something that's close to my heart where I do a lot of research. So I'd have to agree with you. <laughs> awesome. Great, great, great. And so you can see here, we're asking about trust, emotional closeness, honesty, caring, competence, right? And notice we're talking about work. I, I think sometimes when we talk about relationships, people kind of lump all relationships together, right? Like, what are you looking for in a spouse or a partner or a friend? Or what do you want your mom to do yeah. for you? Um, and it is important, I think, that you're seeing this. So let's go back to our slides. This is great. And we're going to come back to menti.com. So you can just leave that window open. And whenever we ask you a, a um, well, I'm going to do this. Got to love the technology. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm trying. So um, we we went through this and you all agreed that. What was kind of interesting about this is that there all of these things were important. So there are people who took who chose emotional closeness, honesty, caring, competence and respect. But over 50 percent of you, half of you pick trust. Yeah. And so we're going to. You, they Talk they a little bit it's more a great about segue. that. Yeah. yeah. And and I think trust as the root of connection is something that Michelle has studied a lot and that I have studied a lot in terms of how we relate and connect to other people. And so we are going to talk about that over the course of the next uh, you know, 20 minutes or so and really dig into what trust is. And how and, do you build it and how do you repair it? Uh, yes, how do you repair it? So I think that's really important for everyone on this call. We know that trust can be violated and we're gonna talk about that in a moment. To begin though, how long have we been talking about trust? So let's see. knowledge you've been given 
you are now on the inside of what I like to call the Burns family circle of trust. So that was a couple of decades ago where we talked about the circle of trust. And I think everybody I knew back then was talking about, are you in the circle of trust? Are you in the circle of trust? Who's in the circle of trust? Um, just introduced this to my 12 year old daughter. And now she thinks this is the most hilarious thing. And I'm like, okay, so apparently 12 is about the age where this stuff starts to become hilarious again. Um, are you in a circle of trust? We've been talking about this for a long time. And we know that trust is placed at the center of many relationships, whether in your family, which you could see here, right? Are you in our family circle of trust? Can we trust you with our secrets? Can we can we give you our emotions to hold them? Um, but what we're going to talk about is outside of that family circle of trust, how does trust fit into work connections? And how do you build cultures at work that promote the development and as Michelle said also report uh, support the repair of that trust so I think what we're going to start with here is just to bring us together Michelle and I were just talking before the call started about how many misunderstandings are because people are not operating with the same definitions of what things are exactly. um, and that's the professors in us <laughs> but um so what do we mean by trust the trust is the willingness to rely on and be vulnerable to another when there is a possibility of harm why is this important? Because when we talk about trust, even we put up those list of things for you all to say, we're not just talking about how likable someone is, right? How much do you like them? How much do you enjoy them? We are talking about vulnerability. We are talking about how much can you give another person to hold when dropping that thing you gave them to hold would be dangerous or harmful to you, right? So when I hand my child the eggs, I am trusting they will not drop the eggs. I am making I'm making myself vulnerable, right? If we need those things, um, that's a very you know simplistic example. But at work, we can all think of opportunities where, okay, I have to trust you to do this thing, and if you don't do it, my career might be harmed, my reputation might be harmed, any of that. And the vulnerability, one thing that's key about this is that there has to be some risk of vulnerability, right? So if you hand someone a task and they do it, because if they don't do it, they'll be fired. You don't trust them anymore than you did before yeah. because there's a consequence to it rather than the, you're allowing yourself to be vulnerable. And trust builds up with these small acts of vulnerability allow trust to build up over time. Absolutely. So and we, yeah, oh. yeah, we're just going to we're going to go and, and Michelle's going to talk a little more. But I just wanted to say really quickly about that is, you know, I think a lot of times we think about trust as somebody else is trustworthy. Um, but I think one of the things we're going to continue to talk about this is how different trust can be in different con in, in different contexts, but also how trust in very in, in a lot of ways is dyadic. And what we mean by that is it requires both of us, um, exactly. and and it requires not just you uh, you are a trustworthy person, but I have to make myself vulnerable in order to demonstrate exactly. And that we sometimes under a us estimate how important it is to feel trusted. So your trust in someone else, they behave differently <laughs> and are more cooperative engaged when they feel that you trust them and you've taken that risk in them. Yeah. So let's talk about what are the key components, core components of trustworthiness. This is called the ABI model of uh, trust Easy developed by Roger, <laughs> Roger Mayer and colleagues. Um, and A stands for ability. So does the person have the ability to follow through on the task, right? So if you ask someone to send you a report, but they don't have, but their internet connection is down, they don't have the ability to do that. So it can be, the ability can be internal to them. They don't have the ability to write the report or they don't have the technology to be able to get it to you. Benevolence is really care and concern. So can you trust this person to look out for things that are important to you? Will they behave and act in your best interest? And then integrity is do people follow a set of ethics that are acceptable to you? So there are a set of ethics that, for instance, people in the mafia follow. To most of us, those aren't a, those aren't an acceptable set of ethics. So it it matters that you both agree on what integrity means. And we're going to run over to a case. So we're going to have you do a little little thinking work um, about uh, a case with three people. There's going to be three people: Terry, Taylor, and Jesse, and they're all different. And what your job is is you're gonna to have to hire one of these people for your team. And we're gonna read you the descriptions. We're gonna put them up, but we're gonna read you the descriptions. You and you're gonna to have to tell us which person, you tell us in the chat, you would hire if these were your three choices to add to your team, okay? 
shall I? Yes. Wonderful. So Terry is first, and I'm going to look over here for a little minute <laughs> so I can read these to you. So Terry, in dealing with, with you, Terry is no-nonsense kind of team member. Terry has always acted on the up and up from everything you've seen and heard. Terry always gets things done well and is respected by all. Your attempts to go to lunch, socialize, and build a relationship have always been politely refused. Terry has a number of friends at work, but you do not seem to be one of them. Are you going to hire Terry onto your team? Let's look at Taylor next. Taylor, you've worked with Taylor for several years. Taylor has always been honest with you and shown genuine concern for others as well as for the profitability of the business. Taylor has always been particularly good to you, and it's clear that Taylor likes and respects you. Taylor has frequ frequently has problems getting customers served on time, getting their paperwork done, does not seem to manage the company's finances very well. Taylor does not seem to have clear objectives about what things are important for the operation of business. So you can see a big difference between Taylor and Terry. And now we're gonna give you the last option, Jesse. Uh, Jesse, you've always found Jesse to have strong skills. You hear Jesse commit to getting a report done and then make a snappy remark about health freezing over. You can recall a number of other occasions when Jesse told someone one thing and turned around and told you something entirely different. Jesse has always been nice to you and seems to like you. Jesse tells you you're a very valuable team member. Do okay. We, do we want to do this in Mentimeter or in chat? Um, let's just do it in chat. Okay, great. I'm, okay. Who so would you hire? Our first person is hiring Terry. Sydney is hiring Terry also. Adding them to their team, Terry, Deanna, Terry Terry, 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 Deanna, Megan, Roberta is hiring to, and do we have anybody for Taylor or Jesse? Terry, but we can't be friends. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, I love that. <laughs> Terry's already nixed the friendship. <laughs> okay. Anybody, anybody with Taylor or Jesse? Okay. So everyone. I prefer to work with Taylor. Okay. So we have one Taylor and a whole bunch of uh, Terry's. So the person who would prefer to work with Taylor, do you want to unmute for a minute and just say why? Um, this is Krista. I chose Taylor. So if I was in like a colleague position, I would much rather work with Taylor. If I was in a manager position, I would probably lean towards hiring Terry. But the thing that stuck out to me with Taylor is that they're honest. They show a genuine concern for others and the profitability of the business. So to me, the performance issues could probably be worked on if we have that trusty relationships and they respected me, then maybe I could give them more feedback. But That's also I can be very naively optimistic sometimes. Okay. Hold on to that no, but yeah. So that, hold on to that because often when people pick Taylor, they're saying, you know, competence can be trained, whereas integrity, you either have it or you don't. So let's take a moment. So yeah, so Sean said we can work and develop Taylor. So Terry is the number one choice. So before pre-pandemic, Terry was the number one choice. Um, and one of the, we can go into the next slide. One of the reasons is because people wanted highly competent people. And you want highly competent people because it, you don't have to monitor them. They're flexible in responding when things happen and they share knowledge with you. So those are all things that trust increases. And so, Taylor is, or Terry is a great person for that. Now, it, it also decreases negative behavior. So you malice, avoidance, defensive behavior are decreased when you trust someone. Now I have this after the pandemic and pre-pandemic because after the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, a lot more people switch to wanting to hire Taylor. And the reason being is that the pandemic showed people how important benevolence was, right? So when you, you people, when your clients were, uh, were far away, when you had employees who were working at home, you needed to trust that they were taking, they were doing things that were in the best interest of the company and in your best interest as a manager when you couldn't see or monitor, you were more vulnerable. And so that role of benevolence really picked up 
And then it dropped off again now that we're we're <laughs> farther away from the pandemic. But you can see the kinds of your know, the context of your organization may really matter. If you're going through a merger, if you're going through a organizational change, benevolence then um, kicks up again. So let's move and talk about um, building trust across differences. And remember that case, we're going to come back to it and figure out what do we do? How can we intervene uh, in, the, uh, in, in the case of Terry, as opposed to just avoiding him and, and him or her and, and not being friends? Being friends. <laughs> Just one option. Yes, and we will return to that again. Hold hold those three, hold particularly Taylor and Terry in your mind and we'll mm -hmm. return to them for our case conversation at the end. And hopefully everything we talk about between now and then can be tools in your toolbox to be able to respond to that case. So one of the issues, you have these three people, right? And you're thinking through trust as being, you know, ability-based, it, it, it could be benevolence-based, integrity-based, is, well, how do we build it, right? How do we consider building this? And, and one of the things that uh, I've been doing in my own work is, is talking about, uh, in our book, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, and we wrote on Shared Sisterhood, which was about building these sort of connections across racial gender differences, religious differences, mm -hmm. socioeconomic status, um, you know, veteran status, disability status, all of these different issues. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons why this is so important is because there was this increasing sense of disconnection and lack of belonging at work. And we're seeing this in, in, increase, um, particularly for people from who are historically marginalized groups. Um, this a lot of this research has come out of schools and education. A lot of people feeling ostracized, bullied. There's a lot of research out of Europe that has been talking about the sort of ostracism and, and how people are not connecting um, and, and are not just not connecting, but are actively excluding. So we started this conversation with loneliness. And, and I think loneliness is is bad, but there's also intentional ostracism, which, it, it, you know, it can be related to that. Um, often we talk about allyship behaviors position for this sort of de vehicle that can improve belonging or inclusion across differences. Um, but one of the, I think the, the key things that we have, that's come out in our research is just how important this idea of connection is and just how important, um, which I'll return to your, that, that idea of trust is and how we build in, how we build that sort of vulnerability. And so this is an example of this in the research that we were building um, um, where we were talking about, I don't know why my outlook is verifying. Okay. Sorry about that. I had a thing, had an alert pop up. Um, one of the things that came out of our research that we did was that when we went into organizations and we looked at inclusive climates. And so one of the, the biggest sort of cultural changes that managers would put into place is, well, we need to make our climate inclusive, which means, you know, people feel like the procedures are fair, fair. people feel like they can bring their whole selves to work. Um, people feel like they, they are, you know, a part of the process. They're participating in this, they are included. Um, and when we talk to, this is an example, this is one of our graphs for black women, but it was also uh, for different racio ethnic groups, including Hispanic and mixed race women that we talked to, um, that being in an inclusive climate was not enough to help them feel that they could trust their coworkers with their real emotions. And what I mean by that is, how are you today, Michelle? I'm fine, right? How's that project going? It's going great. Instead of I'm incredibly frustrated. A US-based answer. <laughs> That's right. right. <laughs> Which is instead of, you know what, I'm actually really frustrated with this component of it. And I'm going to hand a little of my emotion onto you so that you can help me process through it. Um, and that sort of component of connection that again, requires trust because you're making yourself vulnerable. Um, and we find that that matters and that um, p women, particularly from marginalized racial groups, when they worked really um, closely with other people, um, they those inclusive climates um, were not enough to make them feel like they were trusted. And so what was? Right. So you might be saying, well, what was with that? Um, what we found was this idea of risk taking and vulnerability. We mentioned that trust is about vulnerability um, and we put it front and center. We put trust front and center in this model of how people can connect in order to establish trust. We show empathy, which um, Michelle is going to talk about here about perspective taking here in just a moment. You take risks to demonstrate. Right. I, I'm, I, I'm going to share something vulnerable about myself so that you know that you can share something vulnerable with me. Right. Um, and in that, in these small moments, these small moments, right, it's not like, oh, I'm going to just dump my entire life of vulnerability onto you. But let's let's share some moments. Let's establish trust in these small moments of vulnerability. And indeed, what we found and particularly in marginalized groups. And we saw this um, look, you know, I, I have 
white and non-white groups here, which include Asian, Hispanic, um, and Black respondents in this group. Um, but we're also seeing this in other marginalized groups, marginalized religious groups, um, marginalized socioeconomic status groups, which I think are, are really important to, to note here in that when someone was put in a situation where they could take the less vulnerable route, right, or they could be make themselves more vulnerable to career reprisals, right, what we found was that when a person took a risk and spoke up in a moment uh, of, of, you know, conflict, that they were seen as more trustworthy, right? When they showed that vulnerability, they were seen as more trustworthy. And thus, not just, oh, I trust you, but the dyadic, okay, yeah. I can share something with you. I can share a little bit of who I really am with you and start to build those connections. So one of the big uh, issues with trust is it can't, people think of it as taking years to build and seconds to break and forever to repair. <laughs> um, but what we're going to talk about is a piece of the ability, benevolence, integrity model that's missing. And this piece helps us not only build trust, but helps us, um, helps us repair trust. Because I, what I call I call this the myth of trustworthiness, right? Or the myth of trust that people believe that you have to, you can only trust people who always behave in a trustworthy ma manner, right? And they believe that we have to be trustworthy every single second to be trusted by others. But in reality, I would say that's a myth. I would say everybody, including everyone on the call and Beth and I are not trustworthy in the sense that we all fail to meet expectations sometime, right? We are human. And that, and so I would argue that trust is really built in how you react in those moments when you don't meet expectations or another person doesn't meet expectations. So that idea that Taylor can be trained, you know, can have feedback and can be mentored into being as competent as they need to be. And part of really using those moments to move forward is that piece of the ABI model that's really not there. And it's interpersonal understanding and empathy. So understanding where someone is coming from at, in the sense that we are, none of us are perfect, <laughs> allows us to connect in those vulnerable moments when someone hasn't met expectations and move forward for that from that in a way that builds stronger trust. So in terms of, so we want to think about this a model as a bo broken bone healing stronger than it was before versus something that is torn and cannot be repaired. Yeah. The Humpty Dumpty egg yeah, situation. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk about a cognitive piece of empathy because this piece is most, uh, I think, effective in our work relationships, right? And that perspective taking is the cognitive process of imagining a situation from another person's point of view, imagining their thoughts, their feelings, and their appraisal, which means how is this impactful to them? So if we have someone who's a veteran and we have someone who's an elementary school teacher, a same event may impact them very differently based on their experiences. Now, perspective taking is so important is so important because it helps us improve communication. Why? Because when we can think of something from another person's point of view, we phrase it differently, right? So if we're if someone has violated our trust and we think about it from, yeah, um, you know, I've made that mistake too. We approach them and communicate with them in a very different way than we just think than if we just think about them as you made a mistake, right? So it builds that psychological state. It allows us to act with psycho in a to build that psychological safety. Perspective taking builds trust. It helps repair trust because we approach situations differently. It decreases stereotyping, which off, so we're not acting at, out of those implicit biases so quickly. Um, and it makes others feel understood, which is one of the most powerful experiences people can have. If you think of a time when someone has made you feel understood, you're like, ah, okay, you know, it, it creates a holding space. You can share different information. So I'm just gonna give you a couple of research results that might be interesting to you. One is that perspective taking builds trust. Um, so, that's, so that's a piece that's really important. But as a leader, I wanna show you this um, 
uh, research result where perspective taking um, leads to your performance as a leader. So the perspective taking is rated by individuals themselves and leadership performance is rated by their managers. And perspective taking helps build trust, in, especially in terms of credibility. It helps people, other people see vision you have for your job and what you're doing. And it helps people see how you are how you are able to execute. And part of this may be it increases your skills at doing those things more effectively. And part of it is that you're able to communicate these things more effectively in your organization. And the, uh, the fun piece of this, po this puzzle is that we redid this and we asked, instead of asking managers to rate these things, we asked people subordinates. And the same relationships help. So these things are important for managing up and they're important for managing down. So this is an important component, Michelle, yeah. because I think a lot of times, again, people think of trust as being one-sided. Um, obviously, I think this, this cartoon sort of speaks to something that we have both seen, which is a lot of times managers and organizations saying, oh, yes, we have a, such a positive work culture, but they don't actually trust their staff. Um, they don't actually trust that their staff has the ability to do things they're, they're going to do, and they don't actually trust the benevolence, yeah. right, that uh, you have my best interests at heart. I've seen this a lot in the growing sort of, re Michelle mentioned remote work yeah. and hybrid work earlier. I can't tell you, I literally countless number of times I have spoken to high-level managers who are like, yeah, we, we love our staff, they're great, we trust them, but when I break down, well, why don't you want them to have remote work options, it comes down to, I don't believe they know how to do their job without me standing over them, watching them to do their job. Um, and again, what I like to reframe this as is, well, let's talk about trust. Yeah. In exactly. what way are we make, not making ourselves vulnerable? And I've seen the same thing with, during the beginning of the pandemic, when people had to let their employees work <laughs> at home, and then they implemented things like cameras and keystroke counters to make sure that their employees were constantly uh, doing doing work. They didn't know what they were doing, but they knew they were <laughs> they were typing. It, it is very very funny to me because I do think that reframing this as a trust issue is really important. And it's not just about hybrid work. That's you know obviously what we're talking about now, but it's a lot of components for managers and the way in which they manage the performance of employees. Um, because uh, when I talk to employees about this, they will almost always make it a trust issue. My manager doesn't trust me. They don't trust that I know what I'm, that I'm doing. They don't trust that I know how to manage the situation. They don't trust that I, right. They don't trust that I can learn. So they're not giving me these opportunities to learn and they will almost always refer phrase it as a trust issue and the managers almost never see it as a trust issue. And that makes it much more difficult to repair an issue you don't even see. You don't know. It's, it's called that trust blind spot. And so one of the questions you might want to ask yourself when you're thinking about your subordinates is, do they feel like I trust them? Because mm -hmm. even bringing up that question can point into to behaviors that you may be engaging in that might signal that you don't trust them unintentionally. Not yeah. that you don't trust them, but that, oh, when I, wow, I, when I do this, I was I, you know, they're, they're thinking I don't trust them. When I go and read behind on their report and I mark it up or I redo things. Yep. Or I know. make them turn in drafts a number of times. Yeah, exactly. So um, the last couple of slides that we're going to talk about are how as leaders you can facilitate a culture of trust, right? Um, so what can you do? And so what do we know? from research are some options that you have in front of you. I mentioned inclusive climates earlier. Um, inclusive climates are incredibly sort of low hanging fruit, um, kind of necessary, but not sufficient, I think in a lot of ways. Uh, and in and I, I know we you kind of talk about inclusion in a lot of different ways, but we're talking about inclusion across every bit of difference, across you went to Michigan and I went to, to Florida, right? That <laughs> sort of difference, right? We're talking about all of these, these things that might interfere with our ability to empathize or take perspectives. And so what is an inclusive climate? Um, how do you make sure you have one? First of all, make sure your procedures, um, when particularly when it comes to hiring, performance management, and pay are transparent and clear. Everyone knows what the procedure is, how you get promoted, how you get reassigned, what the grievance process is. 
allow people to participate in decision making. And that does not just mean the perfunctory, I have to give you 21 days to comment. It means asking people what, what would work best in this situation. Um, the situation. The the echo model that Krista talked about in terms of these case, this is a great opportunity to bring a case to your employee group, right? And say, Let, let's talk hypothetically, but really this is real, right? Like how, how can we discuss how to manage this? And then also provide an opportunity where people feel like they can bring their whole selves to work, right? Their quirkiness, their strangeness, right? Yeah. They're, the parts of them that make them unique and different. Why is that important? It's important because it is those unique components that make them have different perspectives. Yeah. And that can so make like that value add perspective yeah. versus fit. <laughs> yeah. That can make, that can help make more innovative decisions can help see things that other people might not have seen, right? Um, a, a lot of times when you, I, I rely on my, for instance, my graduate students who come in and they have completely different perspectives than me. They, they may not have, they have different skills than I do, but they're seeing things different and they teach me a lot because I am open to have them bringing their whole selves to work in that way. So that's the first thing. Um, what's the next type of climate that you should be focusing on? And that's a psychological safety climate. Michelle, you talked about psychological yeah. safety. Right? And that's, really having that basis of trust so people can speak their mind they can make mistakes and it's seen as a learning experience yeah. you can you can take a, that you can take these risks you can try new things you can speak up questions you can say i don't know and you are not going to be penalized right it is going to be seen as as an opportunity to learn and grow and not a penalty and yes. exactly. And the original research from this was done in a hospital setting. And the researcher went in thinking that the more structured settings where people were immediately punished for making mistakes would be the settings that were safer. Mm -hmm. And what they found was when there was psychological safety and people were able to talk about near misses, that the rate of medical um, errors actually went down. And so it started this incredible field that's, you know, it's grown, been, it grown since yeah. like 1997, that's looked at healthcare and education and the way that that psychologically safe and uh, climate actually gets you to the end goal that you want, which yeah. is high performance um, when it's counterintuitive. And it, and it can be, it can feel risky to let people have the space to fail, right? Yeah. It's the the whole, I'll just do it myself. It's faster for me to do it myself, right? But then you're communicating, I don't trust you. And then right. people tighten up, right? We see this in sports. We see this in everything, which is if I think you're expecting me to fail and I think that the stakes are so high, then I, t then I get incredibly anxious when I'm trying something new. Yeah. And then I, I don't, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in a lot of ways. I yeah. know you, you think I'm going to fail. And, and you have this prevention focus. So you try to prevent failure. So when you're going at a task, trying to prevent failure versus trying to succeed and be, and it, it's a totally different orientation and what Absolutely. you can achieve is different. And then the final thing here that you can do is to role model, um, role model, get your group involved, um, be a good leader within your group to build uh, group trust. And we have some particular sort of components that, can can help with this. And so um, the first thing is uh, when you interpret other people's behavior, lean into that perspective taking Michelle was talking about. Um, I like to call it this generous intent or just grace, if that's the way you like mm -hmm. to talk about it. Um, what's the most generous interpretation you can give of what your colleague, your employee, your client is doing, right? What's the most generous interpretation of that? Often it's, they didn't know. I should or have taught you better. A bad day. Or they're right. yeah. oh yeah. I tell this with my with my I have a twelve year old daughter <laughs> and and Michelle. We talk about our, our our kids, but a lot, which is I always tell that she comes home complaining about something. I'm like, well, maybe they're just having a bad day. And she's like, seriously, mom? I'm like, well, you don't know, maybe they're just having a bad day. Obviously, there are patterns, and you can yeah. talk about that. Um, but the the most generous interpretation that you can go with, and I worked with a company where this was actually their organizational policy. It was a very small, close knit mm -hmm. um, place, and there was a lot of of high emotions that happened in this in this. It was a a government organization, actually a small like department within a government organization. And this was their policy, which was when a person would come in to the manager to complain, the first thing to say is generous intent. Did you follow it? Which is what's the most generous interpretation of that period in the email, as opposed to the exclamation point that you got, right? Like, were they really trying to undermine you? What's the most generous interpretation of that you can get? Do that first before you bring an issue to me. Oh, and, it, exactly. and it worked incredibly. And I can give an example that I had just recently. I was working with a colleague and they seemed to be a little bit absent and I hadn't said anything. And then they wrote in an email, something kind of suggestive about what was going on. And I said, you know, I didn't know your 
significant other was ill. And it turned out that they had been helping someone through a cancer diagnosis, right? And it had not, and so knowing that everybody has things in their lives that are going on and that generous intent allows you to have a more open discussion and find out how you can support that person yeah. in a different way. And then obviously here for later role modeling and perspective and taking an empathy, which Michelle talked about. And the final thing here uh, before we start to wrap up is uh, risk taking. Find out every, I think all of us feel like we have less power than we do. Um, and your positional power, um, we all have power in one way or another. And so figure out what power you have in your place in the world and what risks you can take to demonstrate that you trust someone take those calculated risks, use them because again, creating that climate of trust and the climate of, of psychological safety is so important. And then Michelle, do you want to wrap us up with a couple of practice things? Yes. Yeah. So these are great things to do in practice. One of them is to record a journal about your interactions. If you're trying to build trust or build a culture of uh, inclusion and belonging, journal the types of things that you're trying, the small um places where you're taking risks and what are the outcomes and how are people responding? Because sometimes when people when people respond the way you expect them, that's great. But when they respond a way that you don't expect them, that gives you information about what their needs are, what's going on. And that's important for that journey. You wanna solicit uh, feedback from multiple people, from people who are above you, for people who are below you, from clients. And that helps you find out what kind of culture you really have. Um, third is take other people's perspectives and know that when you take their perspective, you're likely to be wrong <laughs> because people are bad at perspective taking, but we're good at listening and asking questions. So that taking their perspective is just the first step. And then we see how they respond. And that allows us to ask questions, to add, to really find out their perspective because people like feeling understood and they like uh, feeling that you have taken the time to care, to ask. So take their perspective and then stay curious um, and ask questions to really find out what their perspective is and how you can move that relationship. And then the last is practice generative listening. And this is that generous intent, right? Can you reflect and affirm what other people are saying in a way that puts them in the best possible mm -hmm. light? Let that person rise to the occasion of who they could be in that interaction rather than bring them down to who to a negative assumption you could make about them. And so the final thing we're going to say before we move to revisiting that case is we're going to have you re-enter Mentimeter here, right? And we are going to ask one thing that you feel you could do today to make your workplace more supportive for connections at work. And this is something that we like to do at the end of our, of our presentations to say, what is something you feel like you can walk away with? Um, and then we'll transition for the, for the last, uh, you know, 10 minutes or so to asking about Taylor and Terry again. Yes. Um, I will say one of the things I, you know, while, while folks are typing in uh, what they feel like they could do to make things more supportive, you know, I, I look at the, the idea of listening and, and things like that. I think that is so important. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, we can all put these sort of plans together to think through what's, what's good for our organizations and what we can do. Yeah. Use generous intent, ask better questions, reach out to my staff weekly, um, make time to build relationships with staff and actually listen. Um, make sure I, these are wonderful. And, yeah. and I want to, I see people using generous intent in multiple yeah. ways yeah. when they're teaching other people, not jumping to conclusions when they're, uh, yeah. you know, when they, and somebody said, reach out to their staff at least weekly. That's so important just for people to know you're there. Um, and I think sometimes as managers, we don't want to bother people. And we don't want to suggest that we don't trust them, but the way you reach out matters when you're just reaching yeah. out to connect. Um, I think our colleague Amy says, check up, don't check in. Or, or you know what I yeah. mean? Like, yes, you're exactly. not like, where's the work? Where's the work? And and I think there was a wonderful comment in, that Krista made in the chat about compassion fatigue. And I think um, as I move back to um, my other slides, I'll, I'll say, I think it is important that we recognize that, you know, the dyadic component of trust and connections means that, yes, it feels like work, 
to build connections with people, but those fill your cup just as they fill other people's cup. And, and the research suggests that those small positive moments, those, what we call these high quality connections, these high quality interactions absolutely do stave off some of that strong burnout, right? Yeah, those and I think sometimes it overwhelms us when you think about having to make a big move, having to do something big for someone. <laughs> I need but to when you think all yeah. you can do, you know, when you think just saying hi to someone when they're walking by the water coolers or, you know, sending an email, gee, I haven't yep. you know heard from you in a while. How's everything going? Little tiny, little yep. small things are going to build that connection and make a difference. So now we are going to just finish. We're, we'll put this back up again at the end. We're just going to finish the last few minutes by returning to our case. And we want to ask you, this is a time for you all to unmute. You can write in chat if that's more comfortable to you. But we want to return to Terry and Taylor. You want to start with Terry yeah, first? Yeah, we're going to start yeah. with Terry. So Terry was the person who was on the up and up, um, always getting things done. Um, but your attempts to socialize, you know, really have been refused. So you might not feel that Terry is as benevolent or friendly as your other colleagues. What are some things you could do to build a relationship with someone like Terry? So I want you to take a moment to kind of get into that perspective taking mode. What are some of the things that might be obstacles to Terry and how might you approach the situation? And these could be direct approaches or indirect. And if you all want to... Unmute. If you want to raise your hand so we can just yeah, see that you way. want to um, unmute. We're just trying to get not everyone talking at the same time or put it in the in the chat and we can call call on you to tell us a little more about it. And if you're not feeling uh, comfortable, I'm going to give you another hint. What if we think about Terry as someone who is neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. So someone for which social interactions are very difficult. So maybe they have a small group of friends who they feel comfortable with and can go to lunch with, but in general, making small talk and going to lunch with someone new would be incredibly stressful for them. What are some things you might do? Krista. It's so funny because I was actually overwhelmed by how I would approach this until you brought in that extra context of he's not neurodivergent because then I feel like I would actually approach it. I'd be more comfortable just respecting those boundaries. But yeah, if I was trying to, you know, actually get to know him, I would probably make it super weird and people are starting to filter in here in the chat. Oh, wow. We got a lot. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. So if people would continue to um, interact them with a, a friendly manner. Um, also, I've I worked with several neurodivergent people and just ask them, like, what would be comfortable? I know, you know, what would what would be a way that we could connect? And sometimes people will say, well, you know, I'd like to be on Zoom and I'd like to talk to you on Zoom, but I don't want to have my camera on. Or, you know, it's just certain uh, different types of or, uh, or, yeah. interactions or just, you know, I'm, I'm more comfortable one-on-one -on -one than, in, than in larger groups. Right. Or I'm more comfortable with that. And I think there's some really good respect going on in the chat with all respect that they don't want to be, you know, our friend. Um, but I think also one of the things I think you did a clever job writing us up about Terry, because we can kind of let that word friend really cloud the fact that this is about connection and trust, right? And that you don't have to be, to have positive connections with people, you don't have to be friends, right? And what I mean by that is it doesn't have to be someone that you're like, oh, I'm going to, we're going to have lunch all the time. I'm going to share my life story with, to have those positive micro connections with Terry, right? So I see a lot of, I'm going to continue to treat Terry with respect. I'm going to continue to be my normal friendly self. I'm not going to treat Terry differently because Terry doesn't, you know, doesn't say yes when I socialize, right? What's the most generous way that we can interpret that um, about those boundaries? And again, and yeah. yeah, and those are so important because I think when we first present Terry, people are like, well, I'm just going to ignore Terry. I'm not going to interact with them. And this other perspective allows people to continue yeah. that interaction and connection. And building the perspective taking around. Well, and Karen, look what Karen said. Yeah. Yeah. Friendly you can be friendly without. without friendly and let me friends, tell you, yeah. as someone who is super like extroverted and very high in agreeableness, this was a very hard lesson for me to learn, right? <laughs> that I didn't need everybody to like me all the time, right? Um, or I didn't need to interpret them not wanting to socialize with me as then they're not liking me, 
right? And I think that is a really critical part. When we're in perspective taking, we are putting ourselves in their shoes. And we are, when we're using generous intent, we're saying, what's the most generous intention? Maybe Terry is uncomfortable in these situations. Maybe you're interpreting Terry's, like, Terry might be like, no, I think Beth is great. Like, we're friends, right? You don't know how Terry is perceiving you in that way. And so you don't want to burden them with your particular, potentially erroneous interpretation. interpretation. The and these are things in terms of, these are things you can actually talk about, yeah. right? I think a lot of times we think of these as difficult conversations and we avoid talking to someone um, about something that might be making you uncomfortable or what you want to know more about how they want to connect. Yes, absolutely. And do we want we to finish up? This one, yes. So let's put up Taylor because people have already put great things in the chat about Taylor. So Taylor is the one who's a little bit low performing, but really well intentioned. So if you just re if you just put back the th unmute or put back the things you had in the chat before about um really giving that person more mentoring and different things that you could do to yeah, well, make that a Taylor trusting relationship. To build a trusting yeah. relationship with Taylor. People love Taylor's potential. They do. But also I think there are people who don't. There are people who will say, well, or will label Taylor as, oh, she's nice, but she's not very competent, right? She's that person who, you know, everybody likes to have her around or him around, yeah. but, you know, we can't, we can't actually rely on them. And, and Taylor will pick up on that, right? Yeah. Um, I, I laugh. There was this meme that went through called the personality hire. I don't know if you all saw any of this on like TikTok or Instagram. I should share it with you, Krista. I'll have you put it on the Echo site because it's very, very funny, um, which is, you know, the, the, the girl kind of acting out. She knows nothing about what job's getting done, but she's a connector and she mm -hmm. facilitates all of these connections to help the team succeed. Um, and it's very funny, right? Yeah. But it also shows like, you know, that person doesn't feel like you, they don't, that they're not trusted. And so it's really important that you're not communicating that like, oh, I don't trust you to actually do that project. Right. Yeah. And I, I love how someone here talked about um, being a mentor and being able to work on barriers. And I think that's so important. And when we're talking about mentoring and working on barriers, one of the most important things for us to remember when we're doing our perspective taking is as case managers, you guys are experts, right? And you may be dealing with someone who's a novice. And so there, so you may not remember what you didn't know at that early stage. And so they're maybe making decisions that you're like, how, how could they do that? How do like, you not that see? Out of all the decisions <laughs> to make, that was the worst one, but they didn't know. I did a study um, and it was on nursing handoffs in medical situations. And what we found was most interesting is that the worst handoffs in terms of content of information uh, be, w that was reviewed in medical in their medical cases was experienced nurses handing off to novice nurses who had interacted with that patient before. And the reason was the experienced nurse assumed that the novice nurse had a ton more information from interacting with that patient than they actually had because they didn't have all the experience to code all the different yeah. pieces of that interaction. Yeah. So sometimes we want to think about when we're thinking about someone as not competent is part of it. We've forgotten the learning curve. Yep. And we realize we came up on time. We want to respect your time. It's 1201, our time. So um, we want to make sure that we put our information up here. Thank you all for everyone who participated. Thanks for everybody who shared their opinions about Taylor and Terry and other things in the chat. Um, and if you all have questions or comments. Yeah. Feel free to, con to yeah. reach out to us. Our emails are up there. If you go to the Tippy website, you'll be able to, you'll be able to find our phone numbers also. And we're happy to talk and follow up with anyone. Absolutely. And well, with that, we'll stop sharing. So we're not tiny little faces at the top of your screen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Beth and Michelle. That was truly fantastic. Um, Kyle, could you put the link to the um, evaluation in the chat? So please take a moment to fill this out. Um, if you're wanting to receive credit, we do require that you fill out the evaluation, but also we really take all of your responses into consideration to make improvements to our series. So um, we greatly appreciate it. And it's great to share with our funders as well. So thank you guys so much. Like I said, fabulous, fabulous. Awesome. This Thank you for inviting me. Third time I've listened wonderful. to it. Yes, yes. Anytime, anytime we get to connect, 
and show exactly. our trust. Right? <laughs> we're, we're like that. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Yes, take care, everyone, and hopefully we see you next week. Our next week's session is, I don't know, I gotta look it up. We'll send out information following up or following up. So we hope to see you guys next time. And thanks again.